Artificial intelligence is getting good, dangerously good. AI is the biggest technical thing ever in my lifetime. I mean, it, its influence is hard to overstate. ChatGPT can write and edit and plan, and robots can do your dishes. In some parts of the world, factories are already running without humans. Machines working with machines, dark factories. Humans are more likely to make mistakes than machines. AI is a powerful tool, but as someone who employs hundreds of hardworking Americans and fought to bring manufacturing jobs back to the US, I'm stuck somewhere in the middle. How do I embrace technology without letting it erase the worker? New jobs will be created, some jobs will be lost, every job will be changed. I want to show you some of the ways we're already using it in our factories, along with some lessons we can learn from the last time a massive technological revolution hit humanity. Three inventions destroyed our old world and built a new one. But I also want to talk about how should we value human hands? When people ask you yes or no, will the workforce at Amazon shrink as a result of automation, robots, AI, what do you say? Our populations and sizes where people sit in the footprint is going to vary as we grow. So it'll change? It'll vary as we grow. If you're new here, I'm Pete Roberts. I've spent the last 15 years building Origin, a New England-based company that makes boots and blue jeans and jiu-jitsu gis and apparel right here in the United States using old world craftsmanship. We operate three factories across multiple states and employ over 300 people. You know, I started this company to fight the lie that American manufacturing is dead. I've watched mills shutter and close, whole industries shipped overseas chasing cheap labor. After my community was gutted, I said, no more. The only way I knew how to fight back was to build a timber frame factory in the woods behind my house, and I wanted to bring it all back. What's up, guys? Come on in. The knowledge, the machines, and the soul of my hometown. That meant scouring abandoned mills, resurrecting old equipment, training skilled workers, and rebuilding entire supply chains from scratch. That's a lot. So we're constantly looking for tools and systems to make the business better. This year, that tool is AI. With how accessible these tools are, it's been a no-brainer to just plug them into our business intelligence and creative workflows. One of the first use cases was demand planning. Say we're launching a new t-shirt. In the past, our planning team would analyze previous launches, sales history, and similar products to estimate how many units we should manufacture for the first run. Now, we've built an internal AI agent, and it does the work for us. So check this out. I can upload an image of a new design and it predicts with about a 90% accuracy how many units will sell in the first 30 days. 103 units first 30 days, 72 units, 92 units. In just a few clicks, we can forecast our entire product roadmap. It's freaking amazing. But it's helped me creatively too. You know, I'm a designer. I went to school for art and design, and from day one, I've always had my hands in how we make things. Most recently, while crafting a new American-made sneaker line, I experimented with ChatGPT. I fed it sketches and photos of fabrics we weave in-house. It generated high-quality renders of what the sneaker could look like. I took those images and posted them online minutes later and pulled my audience real-time for feedback. What used to take months and tens of thousands of dollars now takes minutes. We're also using AI to dial in pricing elasticity so products convert better. And we're exploring vision-based AI to assist with quality control. Nothing dramatic, just simple. Simple integration that makes a human task less time consuming. Using tools like this is essential. Speed is an advantage, and as a brand builder and CEO, if I don't adapt, I die. But I've seen the movies too. John Connor riding his Honda dirt bike, running from the Terminator. What happens when this becomes sentient? What happens when it's powerful enough to replace manual labor? 
already seeing where this road leads. This car factory in China uses hundreds of robots to churn out dozens of electric vehicles an hour, 24-7. Dark factories, lights out manufacturing. Facilities designed to run with fewer and fewer people. Sometimes none at all. We realized that employing people was getting increasingly costly. And for this type of work, which involves a lot of repetitive tasks, humans are more likely to make mistakes than machines. Production runs non-stop, 24-7, 365, no injuries, no sick days, no humans to pay. Our job is just to help the robots. When they're doing the welding, we just double check. It's a big change compared to my previous job. You know, it's a hard pill to swallow when I've spent years fighting to bring back human manufacturing to American soil. But this isn't the first time humanity has faced a technological shock this fast, the first rise of the machines happened in the 1700s. Before factories, before assembly lines, before mass production, textiles were made in what we called the cottage industry. They bun in their own home the wool with which they were clothed. In the 17th and 18th century England, most labor happened at home or in small workshops. Families used hand looms to weave fabric, they stitched garments, and they spun yarn by hand one piece at a time. Then the machines arrived. First, the spinning jenny and a water frame. Water power and mechanization paved the way for the rise of Manchester's mills. Now, one worker could outperform 800 cottage workers, crushing the former production time. Centralized factories could produce goods faster and cheaper and at a scale no individual could compete with and output exploded, but there's a cost. Workers were devastated, their skills were devalued, their livelihoods erased, so they fought back. The Luddites, a group of skilled craftsmen, broke into factories and destroyed the machines. But it was futile. The machines returned. Steam engines followed, factories spread, humanity had to adapt. Sounds familiar. But here's the part people forget. Before industrialization, society was locked into feudalism. The laboring man could not go elsewhere for another job. He earned precious little money over his entire lifetime. No mobility or upward trajectory. And in a way, machine-driven industrialization broke that system. Machines helped us build cities, railroads, power grids, infrastructure, transportation, and most importantly, the middle class. Factories meant more people working full time at specialized tasks, but they now had money with which to buy more necessities, enough money to raise their standard of living. Even though revolutions followed, even though the transition was brutal and many suffered and died, it lifted millions out of poverty. Humanity advanced more in a hundred years than in all the centuries before. And now, I think we're entering a second great acceleration. I'm just not sure it's a good one. My guess is, if you go out long enough, assuming there's a continued improvement in AI and robotics, which this seems likely, my prediction is that work will be optional. Optional? Optional. Um, so. We'll take that. There was a growing belief that automation should remove as much work as possible in the name of comfort and convenience. That wasn't bad. Thank you. But I believe comfort without struggle doesn't hold societies together. There was an experiment by a researcher, John Calhoun. Two and a half years ago, we found Dr. John Calhoun knee deep in mice in the mouse heaven he designed. He gave a group of mice everything they could ever want. Unlimited food, space, no predators, no struggle. And at first it looked like utopia, a paradise. Then things got ugly. Social behavior broke down, purpose disappeared. Some mice, which he called the beautiful ones, withdrew completely. They ate and slept and groomed themselves. They stopped mating. They stopped defending territory. They stopped doing anything hard. Here he is lying in the uh, can. These individuals who are not conceiving are the ones which are not stressed. They're the beautiful ones who lack involvement. 
That's the essential story of, of what's going on in our studies. Eventually, the population collapsed and they all died out. Dr. John B. Calhoun with a very sobering look at a possible future for us. The takeaway haunts me when nothing requires you to show up for others, to work, build, fail, compete, and try again, the social fabric unravels. For me, manufacturing isn't just about products, it's about connection to each other and to reality. Work is how we test ourselves, how we earn pride, how we pass on knowledge, how we create purpose. I want AI to support real people, the people who build, fix, and keep the world running. The challenge isn't stopping change, it's embracing it without losing ourselves. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I'm caught in the same vortex as you, but I won't stop one thing, making. It took one man something like 18 hours to make one shoe. The craftsman, at the end of his labors, often had a great sense of accomplishment. No dark factories, just hands and daylight and products built with soul. Mm -hmm.